Hey, y'all. Our journey through the Gospel of Matthew continues apace, and this last Sunday I finished, let's see, that was chapter 11, where there are some good and hard teach, uh, teachings about collective punishment in the afterlife and how it is that it matters how we live day by day and what kind of relationship we have with Jesus. I end up talking a good deal about the practical implications of uh, local churches and how we behave and what we value. And um, spoiler alert, I'm kind of down on entertainment church. I, I don't really like uh, the attractional model of local church. And so I'll kind of explain why I could have done a better job. But um, I, this was, you know, could have done better, could have done worse. But, I, you know, the text itself is so good. And I hope my meditations are helpful for people to, you know, and every ta- time and place in history, the temptation has always been to read the Bible through the lens of the culture in which we live. You know, of course, how, how can you read it through any other lens? But I think one of the jobs of a pastor is to help free people from the culture that they were born into and help them understand the difference between the, the worldly culture that they're a part of and the heavenly culture of Christ. And that's what I think a, a primary job of the church is. So I hope that's what you get out of this segment. Um, I, I could always do better, but I, I think that is uh, the task before us. So uh, I, I hope your mind is open to considering things it's it's not really been open to before. I know that sometimes feels dangerous or even faithless, but uh, I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't think that uh, that it was necessary. So I hope you agree with me. Enjoy. We've been preaching through Matthew chapter, well, the whole gospel of Matthew for some time. Last week we did the first half, first two thirds of Matthew chapter 11. That's the one where John the Baptist reaches out to Jesus, says, are you the one we're waiting for or is there another? We talked about all that last week. Now we're going to pick up where that left off. One of the things I think might be helpful to say at this point It's been, I've never preached through one of the Gospels before. And I didn't know why, but the reason why is there's not a lot of happiness in the Gospels. I don't know if you've noticed this, but week to week as we've gone through these 11 chapters, there's encouragements towards holiness, but there's not a lot of, you know, happiness the way that our culture understands it. Things like you're good enough the way that you are, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay for you. All of your loved ones are going to work out. There really isn't anything like that in the Gospels. There's really nothing like that in the Bible. But Jesus in particular just gives some hard messages to receive. And I know it feels like you're showing up every week and there's a hard word every week. Can you imagine what it was like for people in the presence of Jesus? At a certain point, you either have to believe they only wrote down the hard stuff or you understand that he really only said hard stuff. Even uh, at the end of today's reading, he's going to say, uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But it's sandwiched in between very hard things. So how do we interpret that? I'm going to try and preach not very long today because uh, I want to have communion. We haven't had communion for a few months. It's because we haven't had peace in the community. The early church only had communion. Well, they didn't let people have communion that weren't at peace with one another. Communion was the most powerful thing they did. They didn't really care what the pastor preached very much. They cared about the sacrament of communion. And and the thing is, you know, Paul warns anyone who partakes of the sacrament eats and drinks condemnation against themselves. Uh, I don't remember what word I said, but I didn't say unworthily. That's the important word. (laughs) Yeah, eating and drinking is good, he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. You need, you need to do it. But then he also, Paul warned, anyone who does it unworthily eats and drinks condemnation against themselves. And that's why I, I chose not to have it for a couple of months. I was concerned about the integrity of this community. But we need to be biblical people, and Jesus says that we've got to do this. And so hopefully I'm not going to preach very long, and there will be plenty of space for us to have communion We're going to pick up in chapter 11, verse 20. This is the word of the Lord. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were 
performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You'll go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by the Father, by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to pick back up from there in a minute. But let's, let's go back over this and make sure we understand the basic meaning. Denounce means talk badly about. When he says, woe to you, the Aramaic expression it's based on is a curse formula. It's something akin to damn you, D-A-M-N. He's con- cursing them. We interpret it as woe to you uh, for different reasons. But he is not feeling sorry for them. He is upset with them. He's saying if these miracles had been done, first, the first place was Tyre and Sidon. Those were Gentile areas in modern-day Lebanon. If you know where that is, it's north of Israel. He's saying non-believers, non-covenant people would know how to respond to me better than you do. If they had repented, if you had repented, you would be in good shape. But because you did not repent, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, he says. The inference being you haven't repented. And then he says, uh, because the message of the coming kingdom was given them and they did not repent, the day of judgment will be worse for non-believers than for them. No, worse for them than for non-believers, excuse me. He does the same thing with Capernaum. Do you remember where Capernaum was? That was his home base. That was a place where he set up shop and did the first year probably of his ministry. And now he's cursing them to hell. Hades is another word for hell. We don't get the story of what went wrong there. We just know, he says, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. For anyone who's read Genesis, Sodom was a depraved place. He's saying that they are more depraved than Sodom because they rejected him, because they did not repent. So then in verse, oh heck, what verse is this? 25. He begins praising God because God has revealed the way of life to his loved ones, his elect, his chosen. It's not to the smart, not to the rich, not to those who are loved by the world. He says, you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and you've revealed them to little children. Anytime Jesus brings up children, it's always always a blessing. It's not because children are cute. It's because they were of the lowest status in society. So they were humble, they were of no account, and he says the nature of our Lord is that he doesn't entrust the good news to the respectable, the high and mighty, the elite, he trusts it to the humble, the meek, the lowly. That's what Jesus is praising him for. And he's praising him that he has not revealed it to a lot of people. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, the way is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and many take it, and the gate is narrow and the road difficult that leads to salvation and very few take it he's already told us this yet for some reason we always want to imagine that jesus wants everybody i don't worship a god who wants things and doesn't get things i worship a god who is sovereign sovereign means he gets what he wants he doesn't even want he just gets he demands and he gets because he's lord of all creation amen it isn't that jesus is just oh i really wish everybody would come I really wish I could just, you know, save everybody. He can save everybody. His arm is not short. His blood is not powerless or of limited power. He is all-powerful. He can save everyone he wants to. He will save everyone he wants to. He doesn't want, he demands, he puts stipulations on salvation. Let's look at some memes. 
but before we do that, just one more highlight, and we'll come back to this. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and to those the Son chooses to reveal. So we can't know the Father or the Son by our own free will. It's only when God chooses us first that we can then choose him. This is called preventing or prevenient grace. We are all born in sin and depraved and unredeemable until Christ redeems us. Until he reaches out first, we cannot reach out to him. It's akin to if you were drowning and someone in a boat reaches down and grabs you. You cannot do it on yourself. Now, you can grab the hand back, and you should grab the hand back. But even so, you do not save yourself. You cannot choose to be saved. It's Christ in you that gives you saving faith. <coughs> this goes on in verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some... Oh, 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 this is going back a previous chapter. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wanted you to look at this because we're going to follow up on this idea. We heard this in the last chapter. I think I preached on this three weeks ago. This is Jesus' words. Whatever town or village you enter, stay there for, uh, search there for some worthy person and stay in their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. This clearly overlaps with what we just read, right? You're bringing the good news of salvation, the coming kingdom, the call to repentance. But if someone is not willing to receive that, they condemn themselves. So I I collect memes. You all know this about me. First one says, when you share the gospel, it doesn't matter how that person responds. You've obeyed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not a quote from Scripture, but this is distilled wisdom from Scripture. Of course, it can go wrong. If I show up at somebody's door and yell obscenities at them, then I'm setting them up to fail. But even so, that's not usually what people do. Usually people speak the truth in love, and usually people don't receive it as such. They receive it as a message of hate because they love this world and they're children of the devil. But there are a lot of Christians who extend the good news with a pure heart and people don't receive it well and then they say, well, I must have done something wrong. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, sorry, one second. No one knows the Son except the Father and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What else does Jesus say? This is from John chapter 6, verses 41 through 45. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. The key phrase being here, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So when someone hears the good news, when they hear the message and they're not drawn to it or they're offended by it, they're scandalized by it, it's because God is not drawing them. He's not calling them. It's not because you did something wrong. It's because he's not calling them. Let's look at another reading. I think it skipped over some stuff. Here's here's instructions for us in particular pastors that I take very seriously. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. That means when people want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. When it feels right and when it doesn't feel right. Be prepared all the time. Correct, rebuke, encourage. This is all implied in preaching the gospel, preaching the word. Correct, rebuke, encourage. With great patience and careful instruction. So you don't just throw it out there. Make sure you have good doctrine, but speak authoritatively, speak forcefully. 
For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Friends, I think this scripture is for us in our, I think it's for every church, otherwise it wouldn't be in the Bible, but I think that's for us right now. We're living in a world and a culture that has long ago been overtaken and ruled by those with itchy ears. They don't want to hear the good word. Just turn on almost any church service that broadcasts a worship service. See how much scripture they have in it. Not much. The biggest churches, the growing churches, the most exciting churches, they're the ones that have the least scripture in their worship. They might have exuberant worship. They might have amazingly choreographed stuff. But if you have a church that spends its time in the word, you can't help but notice that it's a very otherworldly message, and it makes people very uncomfortable. I kind of skipped around, so I'm going to go back to some of these memes. It's not our job to convert people. It's not our job to save people. It's not our job to convict people. It's not our job to convince people. It's our job to tell people the convincing convicting converting and saving is the work of the holy spirit that sure makes things sound pretty simple doesn't it it's not my job or your job to special tailor a special message that's going to hit somebody in just the right way hit them at just the right time it's our job just to tell them just to warn them and those whom jesus is calling will receive it as love those who love the world and don't love Jesus will receive it as an insult and as hate. So here is a, an offensive me. I posted this last week and somebody pushed back against me. It says, I took it down. I just didn't think it was helpful in the moment, but I think it's helpful right now. All you can do is warn them. Wake up. If they won't listen, then move on and warn others. This seems to be what Jesus talks about, right? Whenever he says, when you go to a city, find a worthy house, preach the good news, extend your peace. They don't receive you. Wipe the dust off your feet. Go on. It's going to be bad for them in the end. It feels hateful to people, but this is reality. And you don't get to argue with the scriptures. You can say to the scriptures, how is this true? But you can't say, I don't see how this is true. It's obviously true. The thing that's a big problem for a lot of people in this is, does God do collective punishment? Does he punish a group of people? We do see that in the Bible. When you see Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the story of Sodom, the angels punish a whole city because of an excuse or an experience they have with just a few people. And we're told that there were none righteous in that city, and maybe. But in the lead up to that, Abraham is bargaining with God. Surely you're not going to punish Punish the whole city if there's a few righteous people. He bargains them down to a certain number, but he doesn't bargain them down to one. The reality is that we're impacted by one another. We're affected by one another. And, um, and that's bad. Because when we know a lot of people of the world, and we, when we know a lot of people who go to itchy ear churches, you know what I'm saying? The itchy ears, there's a people, time when people are not going to, obey sound doctrine, but they're going to accumulate teachers that scratch their itchy ears. When that's the majority culture around us, then we don't realize how high the bar is set. So here's the situation our church is in. You have a pastor who's read too much history, too much of the Bible, and too much Methodist stuff, and actually believes that God means what he says in the Bible, and who preaches that every week, and is distressed that hardly anyone in this world is stepping up, in this culture is stepping up to the standards of righteousness. I'm delighted when you step up, and I don't want to hear, I'm not, I'm not chewing you out. But what I know is you go home and interact for the rest of the week with people whose standard is far lower than the scriptures. And because you're in better shape than them, there is some comfort there. And it's my job to comfort the afflicted, but to afflict the comforted, comfortable. And so I have to warn you. As a pastor, look, the standard is so high. The scriptural standard for holiness is so high. There were additional memes in here. There were good memes in here. Okay, I'm just going to skip ahead. 
TJ found this one. There was an ancient patriarch uh, named Ignatius of Antioch. Here's, here's why people take offense to me, and I'm not the only one preaching the gospel. But just to be clear, I get emails probably once a week, twice a week from people saying, how do you preach the, the pure word the way that you do? Do your people not hate you? And I answer, some of them do. We just recently had, I added it up, 18 people, including children, that decided they were done with me and left the church. They didn't talk to me. I still don't know the specifics of it, but they're done. And I don't know what there is to it other than I preach a hard word that fits with the gospel, and that causes offense, and people are going to look for any reason to object other than that because they know what that reveals. Do not have Jesus Christ on your lips in the world in your hearts. We just sang a hymn about how Jesus is our only joy, our only hope, our only peace. And yet how many of us want to take hope and joy and peace in things that are not of God? It's idolatry. That train's not going to beat me. Here's another meme. This is St. John of Kronst. I'm not going to get it right. He says, a strange illness has appeared in our days. The passion for distractions. Never before was there such a desire for distractions. People have forgotten how to lead a serious life for the good of others. They have no spiritual life and are bored. They exchange the profound content of a spiritual life for distractions. What madness. It is here that pastors must deploy their strength. They must reintroduce into its life its lost meaning and give back to the people the knowledge of the true purpose of life. That's what I understand my mission to be here, folks. I know that all of you have been raised in the same culture as me to get comfort from family, to get comfort from sports, to get comfort from your side in politics winning, to get comfort from the accumulation of money, to get comfort from the accumulation of friends, to get comfort from leisure and vacations and a nice house and a nice car. All these things you have been raised to believe will bring you joy and happiness and contentment, and they will not. There's only one can do that. His name is Jesus, and when you have him, you don't need all that other stuff. It's my job to wake you up from distractions. It's my job to warn you of the wrath to come. It's my job to point you to the way of salvation. And for your part, it's your part to listen and to scrutinize my words against the scriptures themselves. And if my words hold up, then you need to obey them. Because in that case, it's not my words. It's God's words. And it's not going to work out well for people who ignore God. A.W. Tozer said, Modern religion has accepted the monstrous heresy that noise, size, activity, and bluster make a church pleasing to God. We see these big, exciting churches, and we imagine, oh, God must be pleased with them. That is not what the Bible talks about. You know what pleases God? Faithful disciples. People who die to themselves and live for Christ. People who put their trust entirely in him and nothing else. And he doesn't care how big a church is. He doesn't care how rich you are. He doesn't care how many people like you. Just cares how faithful you are. And we have everything we need for that. We don't have a laser light show. We don't have a rock band. We don't need them. We don't have a multi-million dollar budget. We don't have the most handsome pastor. We don't have the best preacher. We don't have a multifaceted ministry that tailors ourselves to every need of this community. We don't need any of that. We just need faithful disciples who build their lives around Christ and his church. That's it. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to finish the chapter today. We'll come back and talk about anything y'all want to. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. This is Jesus talking. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. A lot of people will quote this out of context, and they'll say, see, it's an easy way with Jesus. And yeah, when you die to yourself and your life is about him, then yeah, it does get really simple. But that's not the case with most people sitting in pews today. The case for most people sitting in pews is we died to self and consigned our lives to Jesus, and then we immediately tried to take it back. 
we immediately started worrying about other things. We immediately started distracting ourselves again. What was that last quote about people who distract themselves? How many of us are more prone to turn on the TV than open our Bibles? That right there is, is damning. We're not here to be distracted. We're not here to be amused and entertained. We're not here to be in leisure. We're here to be holy. Because our Father in heaven is holy. Is he your Father? Then be like him. In Galatians, Paul said, Where then is your blessing of me now? He was talking about how they, they, they used to love him. They used to bless him. Galatians is the angriest letter. He says, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. That's how much you loved me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Friends, this is the frustration that all pastors that preach the word are up against. With love, they pour themselves out to people who then take offense and hate them. And I love those of you who stuck with me for these nine years here. But you've seen it as much as I have. There's been a revolving door with people come in and, oh, they like the music and, oh, they like the people. But something bends their nose out of joint. And they get out of here. And the temptation is to go, oh, we did something wrong. Oh, we, you know, we shouldn't have said that. Oh, we shouldn't have done that. We forget that the point here is not to grow a big church. It's not to please everybody. It's only to please one, and his name is Jesus. If he is pleased, then it doesn't matter who else is pleased with us. But if he's not pleased, it doesn't matter how many people are here with us. If you sell the gospel out to get people in here, you might get them in here, but this becomes a synagogue of Satan, and we don't offer salvation anymore. This message stands counter to American religion nowadays. There are a lot of people who would listen to this message today and take offense at it. And I won't be surprised at all. In Revelation chapter 2, John said, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent... I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. He was writing a church that had loved him rightly at first, but then they'd forgotten their first love. And he's saying, you need to remember that first love. And you need to repent and you need to come back to a right faith because even though I have saved you, I can unsave you. That's what removing the lampstand is. A lampstand is a, a presence of God in you. He says, if you don't want to remember your first love, then I don't have to remember you. I can take the lampstand from you. That's the threat before every church. We like to imagine that we made it in. Now we can pry the doors open and get everybody in. Listen, friends, you cannot be more gracious than God. If you try and be more gracious than God, then you disrespect him. You create an alternate religion. You can't save anybody. It's only the new covenant of Christ Jesus that can save. And he's been very clear about the stipulations. The front end requirement is repentance and faith that leads to holiness. If a church doesn't practice that, if it doesn't preach that, if it doesn't mandate and require that, then it's not a church. It's just a social club that gets together and sings hymns. And what the case is, is we've got a lot of consumer Christians who go from church to church and they say, well, I'm, I'm used to it being tailored for me and not making me too uncomfortable and not preaching too hard at me, not making me feel too uncomfortable about it. And so if you don't give me that, then I'm going to move on. And it's really hard for us to say, Goodbye. But the way I'm reading the scriptures today, guys, that's exactly what's required of us. It's not just an indifference to them, but a joyful sayonara. If they're not interested in the gospel, then we can't have them in here. Because they're going to get us killed. Because we're all affected by one another. Jesus condemned those entire towns because those entire towns were complicit in refusing to repent and refusing to walk in holiness insisting on their way rather than God's way, and they rightfully deserve judgment. The question before this church and every church is, are we going to have it in us to stand against the culture, or are we going to let the culture shame us into silence and into watering down the gospel? That's before every single church. And too many churches answer, okay, we can do some ear tickling. We can compromise on some of this stuff. The way of compromise is the way of damnation, friends. I know we're all told to compromise whenever you're little kids and you're fighting over stuff with your siblings. They say, compromise, you know, share. There is no sharing or compromising the truth. 
If we can't come to terms with this, then uh, we're not going to be able to stand the test. I'm going to give a proper sermon on uh, Bob Sullivan at his service. But one thing I'll say about Bob, even though, I mean, he wasn't always with me, he didn't ever once take offense to me that I knew about. And he was around other people who, who did, and he did not participate in any evil speaking. And the last couple weeks, at least, God's name was on his lips, and he was turned toward the Lord, and he greeted me and all of his brothers and sisters here as friends. It's a willful decision on our part not to take offense at Jesus and his word. And Bob made that decision, and so I'm going to be able to give a very confident sermon about him, just as I've given for many of your loved ones. There are a lot of people I can't give that sermon about, and they're not going to ask me to. And you can choose whether or not to be ashamed of your preacher who says things that offend people, or you can stand by your preacher who's speaking the truth in love. We got a commercial TJ and I just made. Hopefully it's about to, to go up where I'm talking to the people of No Water, and I'm not being mean. Everybody thinks I'm going to be so mean and yelling at them. I'm not mean. I'm not yelling at them, but I am warning them. A lot of people think the church is optional. It's a social club. It's not optional. It's not a social club. It's mandated, built by Christ Jesus, mandated by the scriptures, and you can't be part of it unless you join with others. It's probably going to make a lot of people very mad. But here's the thing. Unless y'all boot me out, I'm not willing to move on from No Water. I love No Water. I love the, li wife, the, the life that my wife and I have, have built here. I love the people that are here this morning. I love what God has given me here. I, I know I just said, hey, you've got to preach the gospel and then move on. I just don't have it in me to do that with y'all. I love you. And maybe the Lord, maybe, you know, if the Lord speaks very clear to me, hey, you've got to move on, then, you know, God help me, I've got to do it. But he hasn't conveyed that to me yet. He's conveyed to me, stay here and love these people. I've gone into the schools, I've gone into the jail, I've gone to local committee meetings, I've gone door to door. I've been nice, I've been sweet, I've been here nine years. It's been long enough, got to try something new. So I'm going to speak directly. I'm not going to say, you children, you're children of Satan and you're going to hell. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, here's the truth and y'all need to deal with it. And if that doesn't work, I don't know what to do with no water. What's to be said about a town of 3,300 people who take offense to the gospel and don't show up at church that preaches it. I don't know. Do y'all think that, that this town doesn't know about our church, doesn't know about your preacher? I think a lot of them know, don't you? We're about to find out. I'd urge you to be in prayer for this town. Because I want to see, it, it's depressing for me to see all these lost people out here. But I'm clear they're not going to come unless Jesus calls them. So let's, let's pray. Let's pray that Jesus would call them. Father, Please call these sinners to repentance. They can't do it unless you bid them. So, Father, glorify yourself. Jesus, lift up your holy name. Holy Spirit, rain down upon this town. Bring a spirit of repentance, a, a sincere desire for truth and righteousness. And, Lord, make us willing and able to offer these things. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.